is Wednesday, October 21st, 2015. This is your morning edition on I-24 News. Coming up later today, UN Chief Ban Ki-moon arrives in Israel and the West Bank to try and calm the wave of violence that is threatening to ignite the region. An exclusive interview with visiting Lithuanian President Dalia Gribaskauti on the show. And later on the show, the future is here. How much of Marty McFly and Doc's futuristic vision have come true? People, it is today. We'll take a closer look. Good morning, I'm Yelavi, and we begin in Israel yet again, where a diplomatic effort is to resolve the recent wave of violence plaguing Israel and the Palestinian territories is underway. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon's arrival in the region yesterday, surprisingly so, to encourage calm between Israelis and Palestinians after weeks of bloody conflict has thus far not yielded any kind of progress. The death toll yesterday climbed further. In the West Bank, three Palestinians were killed by Israeli security forces while attempting to carry out terror attacks, and one Jewish settler was run over by a truck and killed after exiting his car that was pelted by rocks. Violence also broke out on the Gaza border when IDF forces opened fire on what they identified as snipers near the border fence. Gaza medical sources said a 27-year-old Palestinian man was killed. Three others were injured. So all eyes are on the Secretary General of the UN this morning as he heads to Ramallah to meet Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas post his late-night meeting with the Israeli Prime Minister in Jerusalem in his 48-hour blitz trip to try and resolve what seems to be a spiraling situation out of control in the region. Join in studio with us, of course, I-24 News diplomatic correspondent Tal Shalev. Good morning, Good morning to yeah. you. Also with us is the political science department, sorry, the chair of the political science department at Israel Valley College, Dr. Hani Zubeda. Good morning to Good you. Good morning. Let's take a look at the following report that breaks down the latest events from yesterday, the violence in the region, and discuss. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon arrived in Jerusalem Tuesday for something of a surprise visit, with the desired aim of returning some calm to a region plagued by violence for weeks now. I'm here to encourage and support all efforts to lower tensions and prevent the situation from spinning out of control. But alas, it seems the presence of the UN Secretary General in the region was not enough to bring things under control. Indeed, there were a number of incidents Tuesday just in the area surrounding the West Bank city of Hebron. Shortly after 3 p.m. local time, a Palestinian driver rammed his car into a bus station at Gush Etzion Junction, south of Jerusalem, injuring a 21-year-old male and a 20-year-old soldier lightly. The attacker then emerged from the vehicle with a knife before being shot dead by other soldiers at the scene. Another incident, this one fatal, occurred about three hours earlier. A 54-year-old Jewish man from the nearby settlement of Kiryat Arba was driving his vehicle on a road southwest of Hebron when it was hit by rocks. The driver, a father of seven named Avraham Hasnu, then pulled over and emerged from the vehicle, only to be hit by a passing truck. The truck driver at first fled the scene, leaving Hasnu injured on the road. Israeli military paramedics arrived after several minutes and attempted to resuscitate him, but soon pronounced him dead at the scene. The truck driver later turned himself in to Palestinian authorities, saying the incident was an accident. While the recent violence in this area leaves some room for doubt, the roads here are narrow, with vehicles typically traveling at high speed. A short while earlier, yet another incident occurred when a Palestinian stabbed an Israeli army officer in the hand with a knife during clashes that erupted near the village of Beit Awa. The officer was lightly injured and the attacker was shot dead by forces on the scene. The situation in Palestine is unbearable. Our people are living under continuous Israeli occupation and amid increasing settler aggression. This has led our youth to be pressured and desperate over the Israeli government's failure and the absence of any political future that would provide hope of a fair and just peace. Overnight, IDF forces demolished and sealed off a Hebron apartment, which had belonged to Mar al Hashlamun, a Palestinian terrorist who last November ran over a 25 year old Jewish woman with a car before stabbing her to death and injuring two others. He was shot dead in the immediate aftermath of his crime. This was the third home to be demolished as part of Israel's attempted crackdown on terror. They have all belonged to terrorists who committed their crimes in 2014. The IDF said in a statement that the demolition sends a clear message that there is a personal price to pay for involvement in terror. But there is an ongoing debate within Israeli society over the effectiveness of this tactic. Also overnight, IDF forces aided by Israel's internal security services arrested Hassan Youssef, the leader of the Hamas movement in the West Bank. Yusuf, who has been in and out of Israeli prisons numerous times, was later interrogated by the security services. 
Meanwhile, the violence in Israel and the West Bank is having international ramifications, with the Director General of UNESCO, Irena Bokova, publishing a statement Tuesday deploring a proposal by six Arab countries to consider Jerusalem's Western Wall holy to Jews as part of the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound. As we said, the U.N. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon is in the country, but the violence did not stop also overnight or this morning. This morning, a 15-year-old female Palestinian was shot after entering the Jewish settlement of Itzhar in the West Bank, reportedly carrying a knife. That's in addition also to another stabbing attack that took place yesterday in the settlement of Kiryat Arba near Hebron. The IDF said two Palestinians approached an army post where two soldiers were standing guard. One Palestinian stabbed one of the soldiers in the head, inflicting light injuries. The second soldier shot both men, killing them. Now, Ban Ki-moon's arrival gave the heads of state another opportunity to address their people, which they used to repeat their often voiced accusations to, of the other side's incitement and bloodlust. So Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu yesterday on a stage blamed Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas of sparking the current wave of terror by joining Islamic State and Hamas in claims that Israel is threatening the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Abbas himself blamed Netanyahu and his government for bringing Palestinians to a state of despair. Let's hear first what Netanyahu had to say yesterday. Israel vigorously protects the holy sites of all faiths. We keep the status quo. The Palestinians, by contrast, are the ones who violate the status quo. Palestinians have brought explosives into Al-Aqsa Mosque. That's a violation of the status quo. They try violently to prevent Jews and Christians from visiting the Temple Mount. That's another violation of the status quo. Tal Shalev, I-24 News diplomatic correspondent with us in studio. At yesterday's meeting, Ban Ki-moon and Benjamin Netanyahu, other than that presser that we saw, as you so rightfully mentioned, not a presser, um, a statement, so, so, so to speak, I would call it a photo op. What came out of the meeting, do we know? Well, I would say that this uh, snap visit by Ban is mainly a token visit. This is not the um, important part of diplomacy yet weighing in. But um, Israel has been using, uh, did use the meetings yesterday with President Rivlin and with, um, and with the Prime Minister, both of them meeting with Ban Ki-moon, to bring up two things. A, of course, the issue of Palestinian incitement and right. about the fact that Israel feels that the international community has not been loud enough about Palestinian incitement and has not been putting the blame on Palestinian terror. Basically, uh, Israel always feels, especially at the UN, that there is an equation between uh, Israeli actions and Palestinian terror. But the other issue that came up, and this came up also in both meetings, is the issue of uh, the UN, any kind of UN involvement. Israel does not want to see any kind of UN Security Council statement, any kind of UN Security Council resolution, any kind of UNESCO resolution, as a pal and the Palestinians are using exactly these venues to try and uh, uh, um, score points um, in the diplomatic arena. So we heard both from uh, President Rivlin and from Prime Minister Netanyahu that they bring up this issue and they tell the UN Secretary General um, this is not the way to uh, deal with terror. This will not bring an end to terror. This actually only gives a back one to terror. All right. And then when it comes, though, and uh, as again you said, you rightfully mentioned, um, the UN Secretary um, uh, General Ban Ki moon, not to take away from his grand statue, cannot really progress things diplomatically or on the ground, can he? He doesn't have the power to do so. Well, he has the power just <clears> to show, you know, it's important because that was the first the sign exactly. of diplomatic pressure. The international. First international. International pressure. But uh, diplomacy will be stepping up in the upcoming days. Today, uh, Netanyahu will be meeting uh, both uh, Kerry and Chancellor Merkel in Berlin. Tomorrow he will be meeting the EU foreign policy chief, Federica Mogherini, and Kerry will uh, presumably, if everything goes well, fly out to the region uh, right. over the weekend and meet with um, Abbas and uh, King Abdallah separately and try to find a formula to bring down the flames. At the moment, we're talking about he's seeking a formula to reiterate understandings, previous understandings, joint understandings of these three parties, Jordan, the Palestinian Authority, and Israel, about the Temple Mount status quo. Um, these are understandings that Kerry reached last November uh, during the previous round of violence that had to do with that uh, very explosive topic. Um, and uh, of course, everyone is still looking for a formula that could also revive a political Political path forward out of this violence, but it's not clear that for that any of the uh, leaders has po enough political capital. Capital. Okay. Let's go live to Ramallah, where I. Sorry, not to Ramallah. Let's go live to the Kalandia checkpoint in the West Bank, where I-24 News 
correspondent Mohamed al Qasim is standing by. Mohamed, good morning to you. I don't know if you had a chance to hear what was said in studio this morning. But again, an explosive, well, actually a very violent and very tense morning in the West Bank. You are on your way to Ramallah, where Ban Ki-moon also will be heading this morning. But what happened this morning in the West Bank? Good morning to you, Yael. Uh, obviously, it's just a continuation uh, of yesterday. Uh, we woke up early this morning around 5 o'clock to uh, news that uh, one, a 15-year-old uh, girl was shot in her leg by uh, Israeli soldiers when she tried uh, to uh, stab uh, a soldier with a knife close to the settlement of uh, Tsar, uh, just uh, south of uh, Nablus in the West Bank. Uh, after a bloody day in the West Bank and Gaza yesterday, where at least uh, four Palestinians were killed uh, in the West Bank, uh, mainly in, in Hebron and in Bethlehem, and uh, one Israeli settler also was killed close to the Gosh Etzion, uh, settlement and one Palestinian was shot dead uh, yesterday in, in Gaza. So, the, you know, what happened this morning, unfortunately, and I know I sound like a broken record, but it's just a continuation of this wave of violence that has not, ha you know, really stopped or made the, you know, see a, a hope of that it will be stopping anytime soon. Uh, as Tal and you have been discussing in studio, uh, uh, UN uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon is in the region. He made a, a, a surprise uh, visit to Israel yesterday. He met with the president as well as uh, with the Israeli prime minister last night he uh, he's appealing to both you know to the leaders of both uh, Palestinian and Israeli to uh, try to contain this wave of violence and uh, you know appeal to the people to the Israelis as well as the Palestinians that the way the way to achieving peace, lasting peace in the, in the, in the region is not going to be through violence. Uh, later on today, uh, Ban Ki-moon will be meeting with President Abbas around 12.30 here in Ramallah. Uh, after that, uh, we'll see. Uh, he's, and, you know, and, uh, and Prime Muhammad Minister I'm, Netanyahu will be flying to uh, Berlin. And, and Mohammed, I'm asking, when it, when it comes to that meeting in, in, uh, in Ramallah today between Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas and Ban Ki-moon, are the Palestinians of the West Bank expecting something to come out of that meeting, or is there an understanding that this is the first move in a diplomatic maneuver, so to speak, to try and actually just calm the recent wave of violence? Is, are there any expectations there in Ramallah and the West Bank from that meeting? From, from what we heard from people that we talked to, and to be quite honest with you, there is no expectations whatsoever uh, other than this is the first step in, may, in, in what may be uh, an international, uh, the international community making some moves to contain this, uh, this wave of violence. Uh, three weeks after the, you know, after this, this violence uh, episode, now we see the international community trying to do something, you know, with the, with starting with the uh, visit of Ban Ki-moon. We have some meetings uh, between, uh, you know, Netanyahu uh, and Kerry, you, you know, U.S. Secretary General Kerry in Berlin, then he's probably coming to the region. So in terms of expectations here in the West Bank, none whatsoever. And just keep in mind that we heard what Ban Ki-moon, uh, you know, said yesterday. He really did not come to the region with any specific uh, solutions or answers to, to this uh, violence. He's just appealing, making appeals, emotional appeals to the, you know, to both sides. He said right. that we understand that the Israeli is, you know, that Israel and the Israelis have the right uh, to, be, to live in peace, but also he said that uh, there is a vacuum, and uh, not a vacuum, but he said that I know that, uh, you know, the, the frustrations, uh, frustrations of the right. Palestinian people didn't come from a vacuum, that it has been piling up over time. So that's why, I, I, you know, I don't think that there is much expectations of this visit and this meeting, because uh, Ban Ki-moon did not come with, uh, with a package uh, to, to offer to both offer sides. any side, very, very, very true. Mohammed al Qasim from the Kalandia checkpoint in the West Bank. Thank you for joining us this morning. We'll be covering this throughout the morning. Tal Shalev still with me, of course, in studio. When it comes to, you know, this vacuum of a third party to try and resolve the situation, that's clearly a role that everybody in the region is expecting the Americans to play in many, many ways. What is expected? What do we know in terms of these meetings that are expected with Kerry, who's coming into the region? Well, first of all, I'm not sure that everyone in the region is expecting the U.S. to be the mediator here. We're talking, we're after uh, 
um, how much is it, seven years of the Obama administration, which in which he, have, he has had several and various repeating failures in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So it's clear that there's a void here, but there's I'm not void, sure that right people in no the region, player, nobody's no really, player. yeah, of course, no but player. nobody's really yeah. expecting, nobody's really surprised that the U.S. Right. isn't really weighing in. Nobody is surprised that President Obama isn't weighing in. Right. President Obama has been saying again and again that he is still reevaluating his policy vis-a-vis right. -vis, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So that is part of the mess here, that even the U.S. doesn't really have a clear plan forward. Uh, U um, U.S. Secretary Kerry, right. of course, Secretary Kerry, this is one of his life goals. He would right. love to see this happen in the next 16 months. But Kerry has failed in the past, and we should remember that. And we should also remember that last summer, when Kerry flew out to the region to try and mediate during Operation Protective Edge, it took another month for the, uh, for for the yeah. operation to so end. There's one small comment to be made here. There are two cycles that Ban was meeting with. The first cycle was with the president. Very Pump and happy, circumstance. Yeah. very, very, very uh, positive, and so on and so forth. In the prime minister's um, right. cycles, extreme disappointment. Um, not so friendly. Right. They were Because they were resisting his visit, and uh, moreover, they were not so happy with the timing of his visit and the wording that he was using here. They did not like his statements. They did not like what he'd done in the last four years. In you're, the notion, about, you're speaking about Ban Ki-moon? Yes. Yeah. In uh, the notion, and, yeah. and as for Kerry, I agree with Tal. I think that people are looking for a new force, maybe some combination between the EU and the U.S., maybe Russia taking apart. They're already here in Syria. No, they're, they're, they're stepping into... Yeah. yeah, but tragically, and I think it's a bit tragic that just before the quartet was about to try and launch some new process, process very sure. um, with Russia inside, try to build on the P5 plus one, some kind of international power force that would uh, uh, push this conflict forward. But tragically, this couldn't, it didn't happen because this whole cycle of violence erupted. All right, and let's go straight to because speaking of the Americans and that missing vacuum of a third strong party to mediate between the two sides. Rebecca Shimoni Stoyle, Times of Israel correspondent in Washington, D.C., joining us on the phone just now. I don't know if you had a chance to hear this, but it was just clear. I mean, as Tal Shalev said, that over the course of the last seven years, the Americans don't very much want to get involved. What is the, what is the feeling right now in Washington? Kerry heading to the region to do what? Take pictures with the two sides to try and culminate the last year in power, so to speak, of this administration, or actually move things ahead? Well, I think it's a very interesting question. And certainly what Kerry indicated, even as late as last week, is that what he'd really like to do is restart some of a peace process. But as of today, his comments, his latest series of comments, make it quite clear that he's here, he's coming to put out a fire, to calm things in the very short term, and that he's not terribly optimistic that this, this juncture this week, is going to lead to any sort of a greater understanding. Right. And I would like to agree with what everybody has said about this search for maybe this other interlocutor, another way. Um, I was at a talk with Phil Gordon, who was the administration's point man in the Middle East until very recently, and the idea was floated about perhaps involving another party, if not the quartet, then perhaps relooking at the Arab peace plan or any possible way to get some kind of leverage beyond the United States. And that question has been coming up over and over again in Washington. People have been playing with the idea of what other party perhaps could work with the United States to get leverage toward a more comprehensive toward peace deal. Yes, I think, you know, that, that, that's the million-dollar question that all of us here also sitting in the region are waiting to hear. And Rebecca Shimoni Stoll, thank you for being with us this morning from Washington, D.C. Now, aside from the diplomatic aspects of the recent escalation of events, there is also another very concerning aspect discussed here also before the show started by the people around the table the recent days and that is the impact that it has on the israeli society mainly the complex position of the israeli arab minority that makes up 20 percent of the country's citizens most recently several municipalities in israel including that of israel's commercial hub tel aviv have barred entry of contracted maintenance workers many of whom are arabs citing security tensions and to further discuss this let's say hello to the zionist union um, minister of parliament zuhir balul I want to thank 
thank you very much for joining us this morning. And of course, with us is Dr. Hani Zubeder and Tal Shalevan, not letting you go anywhere this morning. I want to ask you, Mr. Balu, because you, I, I have to give a little intro to our um, uh, viewers when it comes to who you are. An Arab Israeli who really rose to fame. I remember you as a little child. You were a very famous sports announcer. I don't think it was easy to rise within Israeli society in those years and days. You are currently a member of the Zionist Union. When you're looking at what's going on right now, as a member of the Zionist Union, why aren't we hearing the left come out more forcefully? You mean inside Israel? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, our, our situation is so sens sensitive uh, situation because uh, on the one hand uh, we are uh, citizens uh, in uh, the country and on the other hand uh, in the DNA of our uh, people, of our Arab minority in Israel, we are Palestinian uh, people. So we are, uh, we are the citizens uh, inside but we are outside uh, from Israel in our uh, you know, empathy uh, to our uh, nation outside Israel. That's an incredibly difficult situation to be here, Dr. Hani Zubeda. I'm, I'm asking you, the people who are, as you said to us, the people who are suffering the most out of this, because there seems to be no distinction sometimes between the, in, within the Israeli Jewish population that an Arab is an Arab is an Arab. Am I right in saying well, that? We, we, to a certain extent, not all of them, but most of them. And, and here goes the problem. We have been living together for almost a decade, um, 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 a century, I'm a sorry. Century. And, and what happened during that century, the beginning was quite well, because we worked together and, and the Arabs accepted the Israelis, well, the Jews, into the Palestinian um, um, area and helped them. But then, as soon as the state was established, all the education and the ability to live with the Arabs was separated. They lived under martial law, and ever since, the notion was throughout schooling and right. socialization, they are the enemy. We, we need to be protected. And this kind of like equation was never broken. So today, we're, even when you see people who live with Arabs, the notion is that it's temporary. We need to find a better solution. We do not need to be together. People need to understand this has to be said. The Arabs are here to stay. We need to learn oh, how Mr. to Bello, live with yes. them. Mr. Bello, uh, uh, one of the of the of the most fact uh, thing in our uh, situation that uh, the most of us uh, never uh, did an anything against the security of the states. Uh, more than uh, 99 uh, percent of our uh, people are uh, adapting uh, the uh, the uh, discipline behavior uh, uh, under under the umbrella of the of the law. Right. Uh, so uh, we are uh, uh, very disciplined people in Israel. Uh, we can uh, uh, separate uh, uh, what it's uh, under the law and what's not. And uh, I think, uh, I think um, uh, Dr. Zbeda uh, uh, put the hand uh, uh, on, on the, the sensitive thing. We, we, we have inside Israel a big failure uh, 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 with the term of uh, the education system right. uh, because we should uh, mod modelized, modelized, right. modelized, renew modelized uh, the, the system of the education. Uh, and I think in my, in my, in my imagination, uh, th they should be a, a new system. Uh, 80 percent uh, uh, Jewish uh, uh, students and uh, uh, 20 students, uh, students, uh, uh, Arab uh, people, and we can uh, 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 grow up uh, uh, in this uh, system uh, in order to reach the university with understanding. No, and then I'm minimum asking you, I'm asking as I started to say, because you know you're an Arab Israeli, Mr. Balloon. As I said, I know you you are you know a, a major figure in my childhood, so to speak. But that's an anomaly. How hard was it growing up as an Arab Israeli in this very country? Hard, very hard, very difficult. Tell I, me. Impossible, I think, because uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, recently, the, in the recent time, uh, recent days, uh, uh, we are we are we are suspects. We are uh, suspect people, Zamila. Suspect that is people. the word. Yeah. Uh, yeah, <laughs> the, 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 the people in Israel uh, are looking for us as as an enemies, uh, not uh, not uh, 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 citizens in Israel. And uh, in, in this atmosphere, we cannot uh, we cannot uh, uh, achieve ourselves. You know, we are under the suspicious suspicious uh, uh, atmosphere in Israel.
It has to be said that this is the way that Israeli kids are socialized. Most of Israeli kids do not meet Arabs during their lifespan other than anecdotal meetings right. in a restaurant when they're going on a field trip to this kind of like communal life between Arabs and Jews in Akko or maybe in Jaffa or maybe in Lod and maybe in Ramla. There is no real integration of the Arab population into the Israeli society. One of the major things that is being attempted at higher education institutions is trying to some some sort of integration of Arabs into the life fabric, but it's too late. When you're 23, 24, meeting for the first time an Arab and viewing him as a human being, not as a fifth column, not in as a In this package enemy. deal, we did our job because uh, we, we adapt ourselves to the uh, appeasement uh, policy, uh, but uh, the others are looking for us as an enemy. As I, an I enemy, think, but yes, yes. tell. But just to react, that some of the, the I, it's true that the situation is very complicated. But uh, as uh, Hani said, as Dr. Zubeda said, many Israeli kids never meet, never have encounters with any Arab, um, with any Arab children, and the uh, figures that they do meet through the media are some of the Arab politicians, not from uh, Mr. Balul's party, but uh, from the Arab list, from the joint list uh, right. today. <laughs> In the past, some of the in the past few years, we have had very vocal politicians. These are the and very uh, confront um, p um, politicians who want to confront Israel and who are very critical of Israel. We also have a prime minister that led into the elections, warning the Israeli public both that the sides, Arabs are going on buses. Both sides, pol yeah, you know, yeah. politicians. Go vote. It, yeah. It's a politician and um, politics and religion basically are ruining the fabric of coexistence. In any case, right. I, I told him. I told the prime minister recently. You are in. Against Incite us. me. It's a very, it's, it's a, yeah. it's a strong word to use these days. You said that to, to the Israeli prime minister. What did he, did he answer? In the Knesset. That? In the Knesset, yes. 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 Over the state. Well, not yes. only <laughs> there was the an MK who uh, suggested that the Arab uh, members of the Knesset should be searched before they enter the house and so on and so forth. It's uh, that uh, is a problem. Pe people, course. people need to understand this comes in a context, and the context is familiarity socialization and integration. This is not out of context. It is important to say, because you don't know who the other is, you fear him automatically. Right. The notion is fifth column. The notion is the enemy from within. Somebody need to dissolve this, because I agree with Zohair, and this is important to say, almost all of the Israeli, those who have citizenship, Palestinians, Arabs, have decided that they're tying their lives with the state of Israel. Right. Now what we need to do is we need to break these ranks of um, um, Help um, them integrate exactly. that decision. In Racism, many ways. ignorance, and so on. So this is the reason I came uh, to the politic, uh, politic map uh, in order to engage between the, the, the both uh, people and in order you to. Have, amen, yeah. and you have engaged us. Sadly, I hope you know politicians are listening. Thank you all for being with me this morning. When we get back, an exclusive interview of Tausha Lab with the Lithuanian president. I'm going to let you say the name. You see, even I have problems. Exactly. Stay with us first. The news will be right back. Okay. Good morning, I24 News Morning Edition on this October. Back to the Future Day, you know what that is? It day? is Back to the Future Day. It's the 21st of October, 21st. 2015. And I'm not hovering on any skateboard, no, I have not. to say. There's no, there are no hovering skateboards, but there's lots of news. There is. So, Ami Kaufman is here. Tal Shalev, I-24 News diplomatic correspondent, is also here because it's just that kind of morning. <laughs> so, yes. We're going to start with Syria. Uh, the U.S. and Russia have agreed on a deal that they hope are going to help avoid clashes in the, in the, air, in the air with their air force in the skies over Syria. And so do it we. It took them about, yeah, you know, yes. it took them about three weeks. The bombing of, uh, the Russian bombing started in uh, 3 of September. Now they only got this agreement. Just want to remind you that, you know, uh, with Israel and Russia, it didn't take that long. Israel, uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu just went to uh, uh, Moscow, had yes. a little chat with Putin, and boom, Very there's true. an agreement right there. This Very one true. took about three weeks uh, to get, uh, and, and basically Could what they're going to share. Is that because, Ben, I'm glad that Tal is miraculous to hear, is that yeah. because the, um, uh, you know, the goals, goals maybe a strong word, of Benjamin Netanyahu and um, uh, Vladimir Putin in Syria are not that different in some ways. Well, that could be the case, and it also could be the case that Israel has no choice but to beg Vladimir Putin <laughs> for mercy that the U.S. can probably stand yes, up a few right. more weeks. <laughs> 
Okay, yes. <laughs> rightfully, rightfully put, yes. Speaking of Syria and Canada, Justin Trudeau, the new uh, prime minister, the 44-year-old prime sorry, minister. I'm sorry, every woman around the world is telling myself. Be, <laughs> he will yes. be. There he is there. Uh, he, wow. he had a speech yesterday, and he also spoke with President Obama on the phone and said that he is going to take out his planes from Syria. He will not uh, be uh, bombing Syrians anymore. He only has, by the That's way, the Canada. Day That's for the first day. <laughs> We're not wasting any time. He only has about six planes in, in uh, Syria and about 70 troops in uh, northern Iraq that are training um, Kurdi, Kurdish uh, fighters. And how to make and maple syrup? OK. Oh, that was below that the That was belt. below, yeah. but, sir, oh. <laughs> no, but that oh. was for one of our editors. But I want to say, because this is a shout out to the control room, that somebody, <laughs> our production um, uh, associate, said that Trudeau looks like somebody Carrie Bradshaw dated. In a in an episode in a Sex in the City episode of yeah. one of the last seasons. Well, yes, I okay. just want to add, but in that conversation with Obama, by the way, apart from Syria, he just, uh, the Trudeau said it was a very warm uh, conversation. They also talked about political power and parenting and how to balance that. And Obama also teased me, Trudeau, right. about my lack of gray hair, but said I'd probably get some quite soon. Um, probably. Obama knows. Obama <laughs> knows. knows exactly. <laughs> he knows very exactly. well, doesn't he? No, it's it's interesting, and it's going to be interesting to see Trudeau. I mean, you know, yeah. goes back. Carry his, as Tal said, on the first day he's already setting his yeah. agenda. Yes. I want to show you some pictures uh, from North Korea. We talked about this yesterday the about reunion? this reunion, amazing reunion of uh, South Korean and North Korean families. About 400 families are being uh, reunited. These are people who have not seen each other for 60 years. Some of them are brothers and sisters. Some of them are actually husbands and wives. No. There's one story here of Lee ok on an 88-year-old South Korean who was going to be reunited with her husband for the first time in 65 years. She is still living in the house that that man, her husband, built before the war in between 1950 and 1953. It's ridiculous that we live in the 21st century and this is still going on. Yeah, look yeah. at these amazing, amazing pictures. These are people who haven't seen them. Most they of them are very, very old in their 80s and 90s. Uh, some of them actually uh, d decided in the last minute not to go because they just weren't feeling well and up for the, for the trip. For the trip. Um, and some of them uh, are probably not going to I mean, see their relatives again after this. Ever again. I mean, it's a, it's a reunion that happens. I mean, they they tried to, the last time it was, it was five, five years, years, five ago. years ago. Right. ago. Right, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. so these are very amazing yeah. pictures, I think. Uh, they're all, look at that, showing pictures, pic album pictures. You recap your life, your entire life, in 12 yeah. minutes. They That's have two hours, and it's going to have six, vi six visits uh, so of two hours. Of two hours. Yeah. Wow. Okay, yes. Um, the migrant crisis we talked about as well yesterday, talking uh, about it today. Again, Slovenia is going to deploy its army to help guard its border with Croatia. As you remember, they said that they can only take in 2,500 migrants a day. They say that they are now taking over 5,000 migrants a day. So now they, the, their, their parliament is voting to uh, use the army. I want to show you this map because it's a good, ma good map from the BBC. Try to understand why. This is a very current map of right. where the borders are closed right now and why for the migrants. The, for the refugees. For the refugees and why they're going in this particular route. As you can see, most of them are in Turkey. We're talking right. about 2.5 million refugees that are in Turkey from Syria, going into Greece, into Macedonia. The Turks, uh, they cannot go into Turkey from Greece because there is a wall There's between a wall. Turkey and Greece. And also, Bulgaria is building a wall uh, with the Turkish border as well. As you can see, they go to uh, Serbia. Hungary, uh, with that red border there, has com now completed its defense. They cannot go to Hungary, which brings them to Croatia and into Slovenia, a small country of 2 million people that is having to deal with this. So that's why we're seeing all these pictures of uh, migrants now, and, and, uh, and of migrants and that that horrific route with red lines as such that I'm sure will be put up as well by the country more borders countries of, are more being borders built. by the countries of entry mm -hmm. and I can't stress this enough you know the European winter that is upon these refugees it's terrifying to think what will happen there in the next coming in month. some areas there they're already freezing temperatures exactly and okay yeah. and uh, let's go to the states. States, real quick. Uh, we've got some new polls, and uh, we have a report about the. Uh, can we? Uh, do we have time yeah, to yeah. see a report? Okay, let's see a report about the latest developments in the, the latest developments. campaign election. Okay. So, actually, no, this is just the polls. We don't have time for the report. All right, so I'll just tell you some of the polls. Please. There's a new poll on the Republican side that says that Trump is still leading very strongly. 27%, Ben Carson at 22%, way, way behind Jeb Bush and Marco Rubio, both from Florida, um, uh, 8%. Percent. That's it. But Trump still the big in drop, the The yeah. big drop, Carly yes. Fiorina dropped 11 points really? to fourth place. She was in, she was in second, second place. place. She dropped uh, uh, 11 points. Now she's at 4 Percent. That was a quick rise and a very quick fall that we've seen from Carly Fiorina. Yet to happen to Trump. And Rubio probably got the Edelson the primary, Edelson money. so he will probably be getting better in the upcoming weeks. There right. is one other poll that shows that Rubio is a bit better than Jeb Bush already, so that might be. So right that might about be it. That. And you yeah. know, all eyes are, I think, today on to see also on the other side if Joe Biden is running. But we are moving along.
Lithuania's president, Dalia Grib... Gribauskaite. Thank you, because this is Tal Shalev, the woman who had an exclusive interview with her when she met Israel's president, Ruben Rivlin, yesterday. She is the Lithuanian. Lithuanian president, that's a woman, and Tal Shalev had the chance to sit with her. Tal, before we look at that interview, tell us, why is she here? Well, uh, Lithuania actually is an interesting case inside the EU. Lithuania is a member of the EU, but it wasn't one of the several countries which actually in the past few uh, uh, year, months and years hasn't been growing more and more critical of Israel's settlement policies. So while we, you hear everyone in the EU very critical very of critical. Israel, in, uh, the, in uh, Lithuania they're only seeking to expand uh, the relationships, to expand the bilateral relationship, and basically the, world, the word settlement isn't part of their lexicon. It's not part of their dictionary. They do not talk about the settlements. They admire Israel. There's a lot growing cooperation, both in trade and in security and cybersecurity. And uh, um, Israel, of course, cherishes any friend it can find <laughs> in the EU. Right. Uh, this is despite the fact that Israel and Lithuania have a dark chapter in history, if we're talking about the Jews, uh, Lithuanian Jews, but there was a huge, huge Jewish community in uh, Lithuania, um, and that is part of the uh, joint heritage and joint history that actually brings the two nations together. So your exclusive interview with the president of Lithuania. Let's have a look. President uh, Grubowskaita, thank you for speaking with us. You arrive here in the Middle East, and uh, in the past few weeks, we have seen more and more reports of uh, Russian military boost in Syria. When you see the Russian planes and the Russian bombings in Syria, do you see a war against ISIS, or is this something else? Uh, of course, something else. We think that it is the first is war to uh, help uh, Assad, and that's it. And when you meet with the Israeli Prime Minister, what advice would you be giving him on this? Usually our experience uh, with Russia, especially Russia, which is today uh, leaded by uh, Mr. Putin, usually we say that uh, don't believe what they say, just try to check what they do. So Israel has been trying to have a constructive dialogue with the Kremlin over, this, um, over the military moves in Syria, trying to deconflict the situation. Do you think there's any chance of a constructive dialogue with uh, um, President Putin? At least I think in the near future we will see more house, and usually it is the case Then Russia is doing something. It's never been uh, for constructive dialogue. You have shared, uh, both of your terms you have shared with uh, the president, with U.S. President Barack Obama. Um, many here in Israel argue that one of the reasons that Putin has gotten stronger is because the, of uh, the American foreign policy. Do you agree? Do you feel that the West has done enough to stand up to Russian aggression? Uh, it's not easy answer. Uh, probably there is truth in everything. Uh, and partly that there was a lack of leadership, in Europe especially, and uh, in Middle East. And uh, this vacuum uh, Putin is trying to fill in. And what, would you, what do you expect from your allies at this point? Are you getting enough? Do you feel that you are getting enough? I think that uh, the problem of lack of leadership is uh, seeing not only uh, in your region but also in Europe and uh, exactly because of that we got a very difficult situation in Ukraine. We still have difficult situation on our borders in Kaliningrad where Russia is exercising and trying to threaten us. Uh, of course, and now the culmination we have uh, Russia's behavior in Syria. Uh, I think the West, uh, which was trying to stick only with sanctions, uh, probably uh, did not everything possible. And we got mess in Libya. Now we are uh, facing probably even larger mess uh, in, uh, in uh, Syria. So I think that uh, for us in the West, we need to rethink our actions. Okay. Um, I want to speak about the Israeli, uh, Israeli relations with Lithuania. It's a wonder for uh, many here in Israel that at a time when Europe is uh, growingly criti critical of Israel and its policies, Lithuania has grown much closer to Israel. The relationship is growing at this point, and uh, Lithuania has uh, refrained from many of the moves um, that the European Union has been trying to promote against Israel. How do you explain this? 
Uh, probably uh, because of some challenges which we as not very large countries or medium-sized countries uh, facing. Uh, your region is very difficult. You have very difficult neighbors. Uh, we have also one very difficult neighbor uh, which is not very friendful and partly unpredictable. So probably these challenges uh, saying that we understand each other better. Our heritage, um, which we are starting to acknowledge better, to evaluate uh, what uh, was happening uh, uh, some 50, 70 years ago, uh, for us became uh, important because it was part of our nation also. And um, uh, yesterday I met with your president, uh, it was on Monday, and uh, he called me Litvak that we both Litvaks, yes, I'm Lithuanian, but I'm Litvak uh, from this point of view. And it is our, our family uh, place uh, where, where our families were born, and myself also, I'm uh, myself from Vilnius. I born in Vilnius and lived all my life in Vilnius. So uh, I think that heritage, uh, history, evaluation, what is important final in life, then you under threat of existential threat, I think probably these are basis why we are turning to each other, understanding more each other. So what are you looking forward to explore? What is this visit? Uh, what are your main goals in this visit? Uh, of course, uh, it is follow-up visit after a beautiful and very warm visit of your previous president, uh, President Perez. And uh, I, I brought with me large uh, also business delegation and our relations uh, starting to blossom in economy, in culture, in, in education, in exchange of scientists. And I think that's the niche, especially in innovative uh, sciences, in uh, biotechnologies, in, in new technologies, where uh, both our countries are achieved already a lot and we can be uh, even better together. You mentioned the history that uh, Israel and uh, Lithuania shares, but there's also a dark chapter in history. And uh, despite the efforts that the Lithuanian government, apparent efforts to commemorate um, um, the Holocaust in recent years, there are still people in, uh, Jew still some Jewish groups that think um, that uh, are critical of uh, what they call a moral equivalence between uh, um, victims of Nazi crimes and victims of the uh, communist, uh, communist crimes. Do you understand why the difference matters to them? Uh, we understand because uh, we also had uh, our history uh, very difficult and sensitive. We lost uh, during the Stalinism period a lot of uh, and the best of our people uh, to Stalin regime. Uh, it, the people were in Siberia and we lost a lot, large uh, part of nation. For us, it is very sensitive also, and partly it was the main reason why we were fighting for our independence. And uh, of course, uh, we uh, understand each nation suffering and each nation's. Uh, the most difficult and dark chapters uh, of their history. Uh, I think that it is uh, misunderstanding to try to blame which um, which dark um, part of history is more important. For each nation, it is important. For for each nation, it is its own uh, uh, worst experience in their history. For even for our families, uh, and I think we need to respect each other's uh, sufferings and each other's memories. Uh, of this uh, very difficult times. Okay. President, thank you very much for speaking with us. Thank you. Thank you. An exclusive interview of I-24 News diplomatic correspondent Tal Shalev. Would say it quickly, Dalia. That is, that was the, the Iron Lady of the Baltics. Definitely the Iron Lady, and I love that women are coming into power in Eastern Europe. When we get back, something entirely different, but so much fun. Back to the Future Day. October 21st, 2015 is today, folks. It's when Marty McFly flew back into the future. Where is my hoverboard? Of course. Stay with us. First, the news. Welcome back. It is still Wednesday, October 21st, 2015. This is still the morning edition on I-24 News. Last I checked, I am still Yael Levy, I think. And we are, firstly, I'm flanked in the studio by two men. <laughs> God, men. Men. Like, I don't know if you're happy or if you're really worried. I, I can't tell from that. Time will tell. Let, let the segment begin. That would be Avri, and we are moving on to the next topic. Who of you recognize the following? We're descending toward Hill Valley, California at 4.29 p.m. on Wednesday, October 21st, 2015. Yes, the future has finally arrived. 
October 21st, 2015, is burned into the minds of Back to the Future fans as the day Doc Brown and Marty McFly travel to in the screen classic 1989 sequel, apparently, to see whether the future, which is actually today's present, stood up to the expectations. We're joined. Yes, yes, hold on, that's the hoverboard. We're joined in studio by the Culture Magazine editor, Avri Rosen, Svi, an aficionado of Back to the Future, a man. Who, who isn't an aficionado of Back to the Future? Okay. Back <laughs> to the Future, it's here today. People, people love it. The movie is seared into the brains of, uh, I think, a couple of generations. We just heard from, from our producer, that, uh, who's younger than us, that she, that she loves it as well. Right. Even though it wasn't out in the time Th that she, she was, was born. Yeah. yeah. But but um, yeah, the future is finally here because, you know, since 2012, there were memes claiming right. that it's, the, well, it's actually it's today. Now. It's today. It's, it's today. today. The future is now. Um, wow. Look at that. Okay, the future was supposed to have these hoverboards. With, yeah, where's what my hoverboard? A lot of things happened, apparently. Things the hoverboard went wrong. not being one of them. The future cannot be, uh, cannot be uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, predicted. Yes, that's Thank the word you. I was looking for. <laughs> Too early for me. Yes. Uh, the future cannot be uh, predicted, but I don't really think they tried, but that's a different, that's that's a different, a different matter. Um, yeah, 1989, uh, uh, when they made the movie, uh, I guess 2015 looks like a faraway uh, mirage. Did, and uh, now uh, people dub this Back to the Future Day, and there's a lot of celebrations uh, going on around it. Uh, we should say Bob Zemeckis, Robert Zemeckis, and Bob Gale made this movie. Sort of, Zemeckis is the director, but Bob Gale really uh, is the one, the writer who kept like the fandom alive. Right. Um, now, um, uh, a lot of people, a lot of people uh, took advantage of this day. Um, Toyota actually okay. brought together, uh, you know, the actors, Marty McFly, Doc Brown, Michael J. Fox, and uh, Christopher Lloyd for a commercial. Uh, let's have a we look at. Uh, let's have a, uh, let's yeah. have a look. Self time of sneakers. I'm waiting for those. <laughs> Dog walking robots. We haven't got there yet. Can you believe we have fax machines to still be around? Yeah, I got a fax machine. <laughs> Who do you fax? I fax the people I fax. One guy in Ohio has a fax machine. You fax him? Well, uh, I'll fax you. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll fax you. Fax you. I'll get back to you. <laughs> now, that is very, 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 Christopher very, Christopher Lloyd looks the same, I want to yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. You know, did. Michael Doc, J. Fox. We know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but... Uh, Michael J. Fox, I, I, so I have to say, it's a moment much. to say that I'm, I'm so... I'm always impressed by this actor. It's amazing. It's amazing because it's such, you know, we're having Parkinson's. It really is. Amazing how He's, he uh, keeps at it. it it's he, just... Yeah. yeah. So... Yeah. But, uh, so we see them talking about the future uh, uh, very sort of humorously, but College Humor actually did a video sort of <laughs> <laughs> mocking the future that they thought uh, there would be right. with them, with uh, Doc and Martin McFly coming into actual 2015. The actual one. Yeah. Oh, we, we gotta see this. Let's take a look. At least it still flies. Cars don't fly. In fact, flying is a real ordeal since the rise of fundamentalist Islamic terrorists has made travel a nightmare of fear and security theater. Uh, what a dark geopolitical era this is. Bummer, Doc. You gotta fit in, Marty. Quick, put these on. Oh, rad. I bet they're like futuristic self-lacing sneakers, right, Doc? What? No. They're called Crocs. <laughs> 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 Very, 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 very good. Yeah. But it's true, you know, the, the, the sad bit of this is that we don't have hoverboards. But people, we've got ISIS. We don't have flying cars. We do have ISIS. We do have ISIS. Yeah, okay. Have, but, yeah. you know, it, it's interesting because the future is never what we try to predict. Nobody predicted the internet or cell phones. True. They thought we'd have true. robots and flying cars. True. Uh, sort of uh, retro future always seems funny. But, you know, I kind of think that uh, what, what they were going for was a, a little bit more of like uh, a caricature of what we think the future is. Well, yeah. I mean, I don't really think they thought it's a caricature of the 1980s, really. You know, with the with the hat with the and hats the hats and and the skateboards and the being skate, high. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's really sort of a yeah. heightened, yeah. A heightened uh, 1980s. Everything we loved in the 80s would have rings in 2015 yeah. in some ways. Yeah, okay. it is funny, but no, I'm glad that didn't work out because the 80s had horrible hoop earrings. <laughs> I'm just saying, okay? And really bad fashion. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, but still, some of the things we saw in the movie are coming to life. Uh, products that we saw in the movie are being uh, brought out. Uh, Pepsi. 
right. is bringing out Pepsi Perfect, which is the bottle that we saw in the movie. I think there's only a few thousands of, uh, of cases made. Uh, which are available online oh, today. That is, wow. Well, it's just, but yeah. it, it's not actually a new Pepsi. It's just Pepsi with uh, with cane sugar instead of corn syrup. With corn syrup, and it looks like a bottle of Soda Stream. It, <laughs> it does. It's a small. <laughs> it's a it's a small uh, bottle, and then to to mock us. Right. And to pour salt on our wounds, I guess. No, maybe it's no, to celebrate the day. No, it's, it's, it's the way you look at it. For you. Okay. Yes. <laughs> They're bringing in hover. They did a commercial for hoverboards. Universal released a commercial for, for hoverboards. hoverboards. Um, yeah, yeah, I guess to mock us. I don't it know for, for the fact I mean, that we don't have. It, isn't that what we all wanted? We wanted a hoverboard. A hoverboard totally. we, we wanted. wanted hoverboard. We wanted hoverboards and flying cars. That, yeah. that by the way, uh, in the movie, you had Mr. Fusion, which took uh, which took uh, garbage and oh. turned. It into energy. Yes. We don't have that. We would have needed that though. Yeah. That would have been good. That would have been really good. Yeah. Maybe we could have, but somebody's not letting us have them yet. Mm -hmm. Can green energy be described? Oh, we're going into conspiracy Cons theories here <laughs> right on the morning. It's interesting. It's, yeah, it's a dark and spooky. Um, okay. So, and yeah, now if you're waiting for a sequel, to, oh God, uh, yes. There will be one? No, there's Good. not going to be one. Uh, Christopher Lloyd said this week he would be up for a sequel, mm. but then uh, but then uh, Bob Semekis said, oh, God, no. <laughs> 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 um, he yeah. has, uh, apparently, they did something very smart. There were, at that time, people don't remember because people think of uh, Bob Semekis as the guy right. uh, who made Forrest Gump and all these uh, Oscar movies, but they were like the young runs of Hollywood. Him right. and Bob Gale, uh, uh, Steven Spielberg, took them uh, to write for him uh, they were like a more of a comedic duo right. uh, uh, writers but they have in the script that nobody can remake or make sequels for the movie without their consent Hallelujah. and he has said about remakes it will literally happen over our dead bodies they would have Hallelujah. to wait until we're dead and even then if uh, we get our estates you know no, if, if, seriously, if they trust us they will make it they will make it no no I agree because uh, I mean let this become the new it's a wonderful life let's not remake you know, and, and, something and, that worked. And he says, yes. you know, a little bit you know, self-congratulatory, but he says, you know, and it's a good movie, so why remake it? Exactly. But he's right. It's a, it stands <laughs> up. You don't it need... Sta yeah, it stands up. That was the other question. Would it stand up today? And I think it would. Um, I mean... Um, uh, uh, a, a different genre, you know. Looking at our, at our producer who saw it in the 90s, it did stand it up then. Stand up I, the think, I think, I think, I mean, it hasn't aged... Not, the comedy has an age and the special effects have an age. I think you can still show it today. And it all boils down, folks, to a really good script. That's and, and that is what really it, that is what it boils down. And if it ain't broke, don't, it, don't fix, fix it. it. And really, okay. and, and write, and write, and write, you know, everything. <coughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. But it is the time, so if it ain't broken, don't fix it. And Ami Kaufman is not broken. Mm. He's here with the spiral viral <laughs> and the bow tie right. that is the web review. Yes. We're sticking with movies. Yes. And uh, the uh, Star Wars, uh, the Force Awakens trailer yes. came out Speaking yesterday. Of sequels, Everybody is talking about Boys it. Club. Yes. Boys Club, yeah. And I actually think, by the way, tickets went on for sale as well, and people just uh, went crazy with the tickets. The world is going crazy with this trailer. We have a report about we it. We have Let's a check report about the Star Wars trailer. Let's take a look. I'm no one. The Force just might be awakening in our new mysterious hero, Rey. The Force, it's calling to you. She teams up with Han and Chewie, along with an ex-stormtrooper turned good guy, Finn. I was raised to do one thing. The bad guys seem to have some kind of new planet-killing Death Star. I will finish what you started. The trailer caused millions of Star Wars fans, even the cast, to suddenly cry out in joy. <gasps> But silenced after record sales and demand caused online ticketing companies to crash. Three things still have us guessing. Whose body is Ray crying over? What's wrong with sad Princess Leia? And the biggest, where is Luke Skywalker? Answers will come, but for fans, me included, a long two months it will be. Clayton Sandell, ABC News, Denver. Wow. Where's Luke Skywalker? Where is, Where is, Where is Luke Skywalker? For me, just seeing Harrison Ford and Carrie Fisher was the highlight of this trailer. And I, no. guess, I guess that means I'm old, right? Because no, just no, seeing no. how they age but, and how they... And the, No, definitely. I mean, that's a heartwarming <laughs> moment for us, yeah. people in our early 30s. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's, it's oh, interesting because in the age where movies are made for 12 and 15-year-olds, this is a movie to excite the 40-year-olds. 
And we should have that because I was seven years old standing in a line that struck all across yeah. 66th Street yeah. to see the so, first one. But and it's, it, it, it's really yeah. amazing to me how much of a craze Star Wars can still make. Yeah. You well, know? Disney is, I Very think, true. the owner of the, per of, of the franchise right sure. yeah. now or something. Yeah. They are, right? Hence, we will see many, many sequels. So, wait, they own Lucas Films? Is that how no, it works? No, they own the They franchise. own Lucas Film. Yeah. They, yeah. Lucas they Film. bought yeah. Lucas yeah. Film. Okay. Lucas yeah. is no longer. This is a Disney thing. They'll, this will be going on forever. Okay. Yes. Okay. And. Interesting headline. This Yelp. Morning. Yelp. Yes. The, 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 uh, the reviewing uh, site yeah. sues South Park <laughs> on Comedy Central <laughs> for $10 million over its latest episode. Oh, yeah. Apparently, because uh, in part of the episode, they, they compared reviewers and Yelp to ISIS terrorists. Can we just see a few seconds Please. from the episode before we talk about it? This is, yeah, a few did seconds. You get him? Did you get him? Did you get him, huh? Here you go. Whoa. Crispy risotto bites from Olive Garden. How do you do it, Eric? I'm a restaurant critic, Butters. I get whatever I want. Jeez. So the cafeteria is back that way, and most of the classrooms are this way down. You! What's the busboy doing here? David is new to our school. Oh, cool. Are you going to clean the tables here, too? How do you get to school? Do you ride your tiny bicicleta? Huh? Shut up. Look, amigo, I'm sorry I only gave your parents' restaurant two stars, but it could have been worse. Why'd you only give them two stars? I'm sorry, but the food totally messed my stomach up. I love it. Did you get him? Did you I'm a food critic. I can yeah. do whatever I want. You're <laughs> <laughs> not yelping. Was the name of the episode. You're not That's... yelping. Yeah. Okay, so um, Yelp is so Yelp, angry. Let, let, me, let, me, let me tell you what Please. Yelp says. Uh, the South Park episode was in extremely bad taste and not funny whatsoever. To say our critics are out there trying to get free food and using racist slurs on little Mexican children is beyond ridiculous. And, and compare as a terrorist is not only cruel, but the definition of libel and slander. But the best part, but the best part. is the reaction from uh, Matt Stone and Trey Parker. Please, the guys who, uh, the you, you're going to love this one. We've taken a hard look at the information presented to us, and after reviewing it, we have given Yelp and their lawsuit only one star. <laughs> their, lawyers, <laughs> their lawyers delivered us legal documents in a very unprofessional manner, not bothering to smile or even a quick handshake. Oh, I love it. The writing on the envelope was barely legible <laughs> and in two different colors. It is our personal opinion that Yelp could do a much better job by not suing us for $10 They Yelp back. They Yelp back. I love it because, seriously, you know, when we go into restaurants, my husband and myself, and he loves, you know, upsetting people. If he doesn't like it, I'm going on Yelp. Really? I'm going on Yelp. I'm giving this a bad review. Yeah. And it's frightening because it's in the hands of people like us who might just be having a bad day. And then we just destroy a business. Very true. Yes. It doesn't okay. exist here in Israel, by the way. It doesn't. it doesn't. I know. No. Yeah, true. Yeah. Don't um, worry. It let's will. Talk yeah. a little, let's talk a little Trump. And uh, Mashable did a little thing where they, where they gave a hair designer. Uh, they said, try to give Trump uh, some better hairdos because we want to take him more seriously. Just let, let's, I want to hear your opinion on a few of these. Let's hear. Let's see a few of them. Okay. This one is called. Let's see the first pick. It's called the Volumizer. <laughs> uh, okay. Let's see the first pick. Can we bring it up? There oh. is the Volumizer. Right. All right. The next the one is the Liza. As it after is Liza the Liza. And Liza, know you little, yeah, little puppy it's the bangs, Liza. whatever you call those. Ouch. That's called the Sea the, the sea Crest. <laughs> I was going to say. The Sea Crest. <laughs> the the sea next crest? one is the Modern Gentleman. <gasps> that looks okay. It's I don't a, think his hair can do that. No, but, but I, okay. I'm, I'm afraid that with hair like that, he might mm -hmm. win. Well, yes. The and Wise Bald Man. That would be you, Ami. <laughs> oh, I am wise. Uh, I am wise. The daddy and, look. Oh, wow. The daddy look. Mm, that looks pretty good. That, that does look pretty good. Uniform yeah. style. This one's called uniform style. Oh, very style. much. That's kind a man buzz cut. I'm going to make America great yeah. again. Yeah. Yeah. The and one millimeter cut. Let's see the one millimeter one cut. One millimeter. No, that's not, that's not the, that the one, one millimeter okay. cut. That's the daddy. And, and then the, if he doesn't want to do that, there's just what called going chestnut. Going chestnut. Just, just making that the, the, the hair that he already has, just make it a little darker. A little darker. Be, yeah, because yeah, the color, the color is so bizarre, sadly. Yeah. Okay, I think that's that is. That's all the time we have, right? That's all the time we have, but it was fabulous. Trump, as you mentioned before, still leading in the polls. 27%. 27%, folks. When we get back, I-24 News Focus magazine takes a closer look at Guatemala. Stay with us. We'll take a closer look at their closer look and first the news. Good morning, I-24 News Morning Edition, the place you should be on this October 21st, 2015. You ask yourself why? Because I'm joined in studio by the Economy Magazine correspondent, Daniel Roth. Good yes, morning. I know, I know. <laughs> of course, with us also, Tyla Heinrich, have Focus Magazine. Good morning. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got nothing funny to say. So, Daniel, I'm back to it's you. It's just morning. It's just the morning. Economy Magazine, what are we looking at? Uh, Justin Trudeau, uh, big winner in Canada. 
I, I have to say this, um, you, you know, I teach a class of media ethics or whatever to international students in Israel. Yes, many of them were Canadians. Couldn't talk to them about anything other than Trudeau. Yeah. yeah. All I know is good-looking guy. He's a good-looking guy. <laughs> He's got a, a famous charismatic father um, who, you know, I grew up in Canada revering uh, uh, for sort of getting through the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which right. was, is essentially the Canadian Constitution. Um, very powerful document. Uh, so he's a popular guy uh, in some circles. In some circles. We have a report about this. <laughs> yes, we, we have a report. Let's watch and then break it down and talk about his tattoo. I'm joking. Let's take a look. <laughs> Canadians have elected a liberal government a result that we have accepted without hesitation. Congratulations and a somewhat bitter taste. After nine and a half years serving as Prime Minister of Canada, Stephen Harper's Conservative government lost the election to the young Liberal Party leader Justin Trudeau on Monday. Trudeau won with a majority government, gaining 180 seats out of the 340 that make up the Canadian Parliament in Ottawa. Thanks to the majority win, Trudeau, at just 43 years of age, has been elected as the country's next Prime Minister. Canadians, Canadians have spoken. You want a government with a vision and an agenda for this country that is positive and ambitious and hopeful. Well, my friends, I promise you tonight that I will lead that government. Trudeau gives hope, especially to the middle class. During his campaign, he promised to reduce their taxes by increasing those of the upper class. More generally, he promised to revive the economy through job creation and a vast program for infrastructure. During the first six months of 2015, Canada's GDP contracted 0.8% in the first quarter and 0.5% between April and June of this year. The reason being the decline of prices of raw materials. The country is a major exporter of goods, particularly of oil. But despite the complexity of these challenges, Justin Trudeau does not seem frightened. If his political career is cut short, the young politician already has had a busy life, with a degree in English literature and educational sciences, as well as many different types of jobs under his belt. But above all, he observed his father, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, in the same place as him 30 years ago. Well, welcome to the 1980s. <laughs> Daniel, you look happy. But, <laughs> um, okay, Trudeau, let, let's touch on this for an issue because I, I'll be the first one to say Canada barely makes it into the headlines of the news. This is making headlines around the world because it is a switch of agenda, so to speak. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm putting this in, in, in funny words, but Harper, right, right Trudeau, left. What, why did this, how did this happen in Canada? Well, first of all, uh, we should say ostensibly right, ostensibly left. Ostensi okay. uh, yeah. It's it's unclear uh, <laughs> whether the liberals will prove to be neoliberals who sort of follow the same tack as the conservatives, uh, cutting but uh, cutting uh, services, cutting programs, uh, but in a nicer way, <laughs> uh, uh, sort of giving a, a little bow, a red bow around the the opposite of a gift, right. uh, or whether they're going to go forward with their platform. Now, their platform Sorry, is yeah. big. It's one of the most uh, impressive platforms I've ever read. You actually read uh, it. Yeah. yeah, and it's, uh, you know, they're, they're promising uh, to run a deficit for the next three years in order to boost the economy. This is something people usually don't talk about. Uh, they're going to run a $10 billion deficit. Uh, or, uh, Ten billion dollars. Ten billion. Is that Sorry, ten million ten, is nothing. Ten yeah, billion. Ten billion dollar uh, deficit uh, over the next three years. Uh, boost infrastructure projects. Uh, boost social programs. Right. Uh, and uh, a number of uh, analysts see this working. They see running a deficit as <coughs> giving the potential for for nearly twenty thousand jobs. Um, uh, for boosting the GDP right. by over a billion dollars. Um, How much does Canada need this? Uh, Canada needs it a lot. Canada is not doing as bad as the U.S. The the gap between rich and poor, uh, the cuts not to social, big. not not as big, but 
it's growing. And uh, you know, during uh, the conservative government's reign, uh, there was there were cuts to everything from uh, uh, science uh, science funding to census. They cut the census, which uh, most people agree is is something a minimum that a modern country needs to know who they're serving. Right. Uh, they cut uh, the public broadcasting. They cut. Uh, they put uh, more and more money into military. It, it was. Right. A, it's interesting because to know the first thing he does on his first day on the job, apropos of the military, and that we had in press this morning, is basically announced that not that you know Canadian military presence in Iraq is substantial in any way, shape, or form, or that the amount of planes that they had in Syria, which I think was <coughs> twenty or no seven, yeah, um, seven, and then or small, small, small or seventy um, uh, advisors in Iraq, that he's pulling them out immediately just to show, this is me. You know, this is already when he comes to you know mm -hmm. where where my you know my agenda lies. Well, he he's uh, reflecting something that is uh, ingrained in Canadian culture, and that is that uh, Canada is not uh, a warring country. Canada is a helping country. Canada is uh, uh, sees themselves as uh, police. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, peace, peace peacekeepers. Yeah. Uh, yeah, policers uh, as yeah. opposed to soldiers. They see themselves as, as helping to keep the peace in the world and not out uh, part of invasion forces or, or you know, right. they'll help train people to take care of themselves. So he's he's doing something that, that he he sees in the Canadian populace and sort of... Uh, and uh, is resonating also, has seems to has, have absolutely. resonated in these elections because the win was quite, you know, by, by you know, by it was a respectable huge. margin. So it this, was uh, literally yeah. a record. Uh, uh, going from the the trouncing they took in the last election right. uh, to where they are now is literally a record in seat gains. I, I, I think it might be the platform could also be the tattoo. Um, yes, it I, could yeah. be the tattoo. <laughs> yeah, it could be the tattoo because all I mean I think Tal Heinrich and myself before we move on, my you know my interest is I think it's great and we've just dissected it. What did he do for a living? What are all these other jobs? What is in his past, and do we think that he won, you know, just because of his name? Well, it's it's a good question whether yeah. he won because of his name. Uh, Didn't work. Like, like I was saying, uh, the platform is incredible. Right. Uh, uh, the question is whether people read platforms. He was he was a teacher primarily, a drama right. teacher, a math teacher. He uh, he was pri that was his job, and actually the conservatives uh, tried to use that against him and say this guy is just a teacher. Oh, nice. Uh, now the liberals <laughs> fumbled a little bit, and then, and instead of saying no, no, he. He's, he's got experience. Yeah. They should have said, no, actually, teachers are among, are among the most uh, important people in our society. Yes. Uh, and I think you yeah. can see that in the way he carries himself. He does carry himself uh, as an educator might. Yeah. Um, no, no, as an educator might. And I, th and I have a feeling you were a little bit of a teacher yourself. Yes. <laughs> yes, there we have it. Um, Daniel Roth, such a pleasure. I haven't seen you in a long while, but yes. we're not going to schmooze right now because it's the time mm -hmm. to move to Tal Heinrich. Did I, like, I just, I gave you, you did. I did, I did. Um, uh, of Focus Magazine host, anchor of Focus Magazine, which is airing tonight. And what is tonight on Focus? 640 GMT. Um, so from elections to elections, yes. there are also elections in Guatemala taking place. So we're lending in Guatemala this week. And um, I mean, it's as important as the Canadian one, maybe not getting as much as international media right. spotlight, but probably will on October 25th. Because the first round of elections, maybe let's give you some, uh, our some audience, background. Yeah, some yeah. background, because um, the people of Guatemala have overthrown the corrupt regime of the former president, Otto Perez Molina. So the former president and the vice president are now in uh, a Guatemala City prison for taking part in a corruption ring known as La Linea. This is how oh. they call it there. Basically, they were discounting tariffs in exchange for bribes from importers. Okay. So, um, Simply and Yes, exactly. <laughs> so yeah. so uh, they were overthrown and the country went to the polls first on October 6th. And since no no candidate uh, really? received more than 50 percent of the votes, uh, there They're are going a, again. a runoff. Exactly. Okay. So uh, the candidate who took the majority of the votes in the first round is Jimmy Morales. Okay. He's, um, I would say more to the right, um, <laughs> yeah. Of the um, dial, oh, yeah, okay. Exactly, um, if you look at the Guatemala political scale. Um, so uh, he's a former comedian, 
Yes, very interesting. What's going on with the world? I was about to say, yes. former bounces, <laughs> um, comedians. I'm running for politics. Let's see if you can if you yeah. can find some resembleness because yeah. the second candidate who's going through this runoff is a former first lady. Oh, you know, so nice. it's like a former first lady okay. and, and a former TV presenter comedian, nice. just like the American elections. And uh -huh. um, Morales, um, his party actually won only nine percent of the seats in the parliament, so it will be very very difficult for him to govern if elected. We talked to. Juan Luis Font, who's a local journalist, and asked him if his inexperience in Guatemalan politics stands in his favor or, or viewed as a disadvantage. Let's have a listen. Right now, at this moment, and along almost 2015, Guatemalan citizens have been very critic against the traditional politicians in our country. They are considered corrupt. They are considered very inefficient, and then they are considered selfish and only interested in their own greedy um, well-being. That's it. So Mr. Morales is right on the, on the top of that wave that is uh, going against traditional politicians, being a comedian, being somebody who is an outsider is an advantage for him. Now, it's interesting that, you know, the greater public in many places around the world, and it's funny that television has become this medium where, you know, people get to know somebody and then they'll vote them into politics. But, you know, it, it's the agenda that I understand in terms of the corruption that makes sense. But, okay, so well, he's... Against uh, running mm -hmm. against Sandra Torres, who is right. a former first lady, as I said, um, I mean, very similar to Hillary Clinton, I would say, because she has a strong party behind her. She's a Democrat. Let's see what Juan has to say about, about her, her in his analysis. Yeah. <laughs> Well, in a way, she's a Guatemalan version of Hillary Clinton. But I would say that there is very little of a feasible comparison against a Democratic American party and a, and a Guatemalan political party. Because Guatemalan parties don't have those big, strong structures that um, an American party could have in the United States. So she's the, I mean, the West, the American Western version, so to speak. Yeah, I would say so. But but you know, in, in Hebrew, maybe in ancient Hebrew, we have a saying which means not the mouse is the thief, is the thief, but but the hole in the wall. So okay. Guatemala needs to go through a certain systematic political change in order to corru uh, to assure a non-corrupt, no. uh, sustainable regime. Sus yeah, exactly. Like well, he that's said. Such a philosophical question. Doesn't a, doesn't a, doesn't an administration become corrupt the second it is voted into power? Um, but that's yeah. <laughs> I would say the hole yeah. in the wall. So uh, our next stop in our journey yeah. in Guatemala is a Tejido Museum. Tejido is a certain um, dress, a, a weaving textile technique, and it's very colorful. Let's see what it is. Okay. A tejido is uh, the art of weaving. It's the product of, of a hand uh, instrument that is called telar de cintura. If you are to translate it, it's a waist loom. It is a pre-Hispanic instrument. And so uh, a tejido also is referred to the item that is made on the, on the loom itself. So uh, by indigenous uh, people in uh, Guatemala, mostly indigenous women. I, hey, I, I will get you one. I was about to say, exactly. you bring me this with the teas <laughs> and the whole little thingies in the back. And but so you're many, not a Maya descendant. I'm not a Maya. Yeah. He's a Maya descendant. Yes, for right. real. As hey. Daniel Roth and I just mentioned, the people who predicted the end of the world. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Good. Um, uh, and, so and, we thought. So we thought. Yeah. yeah. Maybe and another. Got the year wrong. Yeah. Okay. Another very interesting fact about Guatemala that you probably I don't know maybe you know because that, maybe you've been there. Um, so they have in their territory 22 volcanoes and three of them are still very active and like something like two weeks ago uh, the Fuego uh, uh, volcano erupted and it's very dangerous because it's adjacent to uh, Antigua Guatemala volcanoes. Yeah. Colorful dresses and elections that are democratic. Interesting. No, focus tonight at 640 GMT. 640 GMT. Lentel Heinrich of Focus Magazine. Thank you so much for that one. Of course, Daniel Roth as well. Exciting elections around the world. Yeah. Um, uh, definitely. Of course, this was it for us. I24 News Morning Edition. Do not forget to check us out on Facebook, Twitter, all those social networks where you get the news and where we live. And tune in tomorrow morning for another edition of the Morning Edition, the place you should be to start your day. Stay with I24 News for the rest of the day. Thank you.